If you have ever written a document, read a book, made a PowerPoint presentation, built a website, or even worked with text in general, then you have used font rasterization. Font rasterization is the process of converting a vector description to a raster or bitmap description. In other words, font rasterization is converting mathematical formulas to pixels on the screen that you're using. We use this process every day when we use our phones, but have you ever wondered how it really works? Computers display graphics to us by using pixels on a screen. In the 80s and 90s, we had very limited resolutions because computing power was not sufficient enough to support a lot of pixels on the screen. Now, we have resolutions that can contain upwards of 33 million pixels on a screen. Compared to a Nintendo Game Boy, which only has around 23,000 pixels on the screen, this is insane. Now, why are we talking about pixels and screen resolutions? Because in order to understand the evolution of font rasterization, you must understand where we came from and where we are now. If I asked you how to represent text using a limited number of pixels, how would you do it? Well, the easiest way I can think of would be to simply plot the pixels in the shape of letters. This is simple and straightforward, and it's very easy to communicate to a computer that deals with pixels. So, plotting the letter A would look something like this. I could also plot the letter B, and so on and so forth. We can very easily calculate how much computer memory this would take up per character set. If we assume each pixel is represented by 8 bits, allowing a grayscale image to add some variety, and each letter is only 32 by 32 pixels, then storing the English alphabet would only take up around 425,000 bits. We know that 8 bits is 1 byte. So this would take up 53,000 bytes or around 53 kilobytes. This is great. We can store an alphabet in a way that's easy to communicate to the computer. And it also takes up very little space on the computer. But there's one problem. What if we want a different font size? Unfortunately, our whole technique breaks down here. The process I just described is how the bitmap file format works, which was created around 1986. Around 1991, Apple decided to add support for a new font file format that would solve our problem, the true type file format. So, we must revisit our original question. If I asked you how to represent text using an unknown number of pixels, how would you do it? Before, we assumed you knew how many pixels you could use and it was limited. But now, let's assume that the user could use a 12 pixel font size or a 512 pixel font size. How do you represent the letter A for both of those? Well, you could create a bitmap file for both pixel sizes and switch the file for different sizes, but this is very inefficient and costly. A 512 pixel font size for the English alphabet would take around 109 million bits or 13.3 megabytes. We are now wasting a lot of memory for the different font sizes and we are multiplying the amount of work for ourselves by having to recreate the font for every different font size. Instead, let's use math to solve this problem. We know that you can represent curves in math using an equation. There are different kinds of curves that you can create. For example, a quadratic curve looks like this. A cubic curve looks like this. A logarithmic curve looks like this, and there are many more. We can also translate these curves by simply adding offsets to our equation. We can offset any curve vertically by adding a number outside the equation, and horizontally by adding a number inside the equation. We can do all sorts of transformations to our curve by modifying it slightly to get different results. Now we know two things. One, we can represent any curve using an equation. Two, a letter is just a combination of several different types of curves. Now that we know this, we can set out to represent a font as a series of mathematical curves that describe each letter. But how do we do this? We could define a set of points that we want our curve to pass through. Then we could connect each of these points with a straight line. But for letters like C, this won't work very well because of the curvature.
We could create a polynomial to pass through each of these points, and there are entire procedures to do this. One of these procedures is known as Lagrange interpolation, which will create a polynomial that will pass through all of your points. But this doesn't give sharp edges that are expected in a letter like capital A. So we have two techniques that work for different types of letters. Why don't we combine them? That's exactly the process that the true type file format takes. It combines straight lines and simple second order Bezier curves to describe a set of letters. A Bezier curve is special because it can represent a curve using a set of control points, P0 through Pn, where P0 and Pn are the endpoints, and all the in-between points are control points. These control points describe how the curve should bend, and if we keep it simple with second order Bezier curves, then we only ever have three points to describe a curve that only bends in one direction. Now, we have a solution. We can represent the outline of a letter using a series of points and a description that tells us whether the next two points are a line or the next three points are a Bezier curve. We have another problem though. Sure, we can draw the outline of the shape, but this does not help us draw solid letters. Remember, computers are made of discrete pixels, and all we have is a way to describe a series of curves that describes the outline of the letter. So how do we fill the letter in? Well, the simplest way we could do this is by drawing the outline first. This will give us a closed set of pixels which outline the letter. Once we have the outline drawn, we can simply pick a pixel inside the letter and fill the shape from there. This will work fairly well. However, when we get to a complex letter like capital B, we run into another problem. What is the inside of the letter? We intuitively know that it's these pixels, but how does the computer know it's these pixels and not the pixels inside the holes as well? Well, some clever mathematicians have already solved this for us. Let's look at this problem from another angle. Instead of drawing the outline, why don't we test each pixel to determine whether it is inside the outline or outside the outline? If we think about it this way, we can come up with a solution that should work. Notice that with the letter capital B, we can look at a pixel over here. And if we draw a line to the right, how many times do we hit a line? Well, we run into four lines. What about when we start inside here? We run into three lines. And what about in here? Two lines. And here? We run into one line. There's a pattern. Every time a pixel is inside the outline of B, we run into an odd number of lines going to the right. But if the pixel is outside the outline of B, we run into an even number of lines. The true type file format simplifies this concept even more by introducing a winding contour, which is a curve that goes clockwise, and a non-winding contour, which is a curve that goes counterclockwise. Whenever we test a pixel, we can simply add one every time we hit a winding contour, and subtract one every time we hit a non-winding contour. When we add it all up, we will get zero if the pixel is outside the curve, and a non-zero value when the pixel is inside the curve. This brings up the question of how do we test if a pixel is going to hit a curve? In order to understand how we can check if a pixel is going to hit a curve, we first have to understand how a Bezier curve works. Let's start with the simplest Bezier curve, which happens to be a straight line. Imagine we have two points, P0 and P1. What if we want to represent the line between these two points using one function? When we input 0 to this function, we should get P0, and when we input 1 to this function, we should get P1. We will call this parameter t. If P0 is located at 10, 0, and P1 is at 20, 0, and I asked you what P of 0.5 is, what would you say? If you said 15, you guessed correctly. What about P of 0.75? Well. If you guess 17.5, you guess correctly. This makes a lot of sense to us intuitively, but what is our brain doing behind the scenes? We can abstract this into an equation pretty easily. We're simply doing 20 minus 10 times t plus 10. 
If we abstract this one more time, we can say more generally that p of t equals p1 minus p0 times t plus p0. Now we have one equation that can give us any line based off of two points. Let's rearrange this equation to look like p of t equals p1 times t minus p0 times t plus p0. We can factor out p0 and we get an equation that looks like this. p of t equals p1 times t plus one minus t times p0. Now that the equation looks like this, we can actually intuit what is happening behind the scenes. We're actually taking a weighted average between p0 and p1, which gives us our result. It will be helpful to think of a Bezier curve as a weighted average between all the control points. This is great, but this still doesn't help us figure out how to find a curve where a third point is the control point. Well, imagine that we now have a third point and we want to draw a curve that bends towards that control point. When we define a Bezier curve, we want points P0 and P2 to have equal weight and how it bends towards P1. How can we do this? Well, let's draw two straight lines, one from P0 to P1 and the other from P1 to P2. We know that we can create an equation P of T for P0 to P1 and for P1 to P2. Let's call these lines Q0 and Q1. What if we just draw a third line from Q0 to Q1 and we create an equation to interpolate between them. Well, we can use the same equation as before. p of t equals p1 times t plus p0 times one minus t. We can rewrite this though in terms of q0 and q1. This would give us p of t equals q1 times t plus q0 times one minus t. And if we plug it all in, we get this. This will give us a nice Bezier curve from zero to one that goes through P0 and P2 and is bent towards P1. We can graphically visualize this as an interpolation between Q0 and Q1 like this. Now that we can generate any equation for a Bezier curve using three points, we can find a way to see if a pixel is located at some position x, y, intersects with this line P of t going to the right. How do we check if a pixel will hit the curve? Well, let's imagine that the point x, y is actually the origin. We can achieve this mathematically by simply translating each of our points, p0, p1, and p2, by subtracting the position x, y. Now, if we look at p of t in relation to the origin, how can we tell if this point will intersect with p of t? Well, this is now just a simple question of finding the roots of this equation. We know that the equation is simply a quadratic function, and we should remember from pre-algebra that we can solve for the roots of the quadratic function using the quadratic equation. But our formula does not look like a quadratic function. So how can we find the roots? Well, let's rearrange our formula P of t. If we multiply all of the terms together, we get this. This still doesn't look like a quadratic function. So let's expand the multiplication next. Now P of t looks like this. Next. We'll distribute p0 and combine like terms. Ah, do you see it? There's now a quadratic function hiding in there. Let's factor out all the like terms and see what we get. Remember, a quadratic equation in standard form looks like y equals ax squared plus bx plus c. Looking at our equation p of t, we can clearly see what a, b, and c are. Now, to find the roots, it's a simple matter of setting the equation equal to zero and plugging in the y-coordinates of each point and solving using the quadratic equation. The quadratic equation will give us one, two, or no roots, depending on how many roots the function has. We can check each real root and see if the value t is less than zero or greater than one. If it's less than zero or greater than one, it will not intersect with our Bezier curve. If one or both of the roots is between zero and one, then we will intersect with the Bezier curve. Now we can test every pixel and see whether it will hit any of our curves simply by plugging in a few values. Using all of the combined techniques, we can now use a collection of points to define how a letter should be drawn. 
We can then connect these points using Bezier curves and determine whether a pixel should be on or off by testing it and seeing how many curves it hits. There are a myriad of other problems that you will encounter using this technique. Some problems to consider are what happens when a pixel hits the junction between two curves? What happens when a pixel hits a horizontal line? What happens when a pixel is on a curve? The TrueType format sets out to solve all these issues with a complicated set of instructions that are defined to handle all of these edge cases, which I will not be covering. I hope that this video has showed you how something as simple as displaying text through a computer screen is not as simple as it may appear. If we take a deep dive into the mathematics behind it all though, we can see how you could create a procedure to transform a series of curves into the text that you look at on a daily basis. Thanks for watching.